Accessing art. Attention viewers, Big Jack Films is unavailable at the moment due to missing in action. But he has left a recording before his absence for you to enjoy. The following is a fan-based video review under fair use. Kong King of Atlantis is owned by BKN International, Ellipse Anime, and Warner Home Video. Please support the official release and streaming services. What's up? It's Big Jack Films here, and welcome back to the King Kong Review Series. Well, we're going back to this, aren't we? In 2000, after the success of Godzilla the Animated Series based on the 1998 film, that's not Godzilla, 2001 saw the release of Kong the Animated Series crashing in on the Kaiju Kids TV craze. Produced by BKN International, who produced a ton of Canadian kids cartoons, and Ellipse Anime, the animation company, and partnered with Nevada on Babar, Rupert, Tintin, among many others, the show was a surprise hit for kids TV and lasted for a good two seasons spanning 40 episodes. And to this day, despite me trying to stomach it, I just didn't care for it. I already talked about it briefly in my second season, which to this day, the first half could have been done better. I was in a rush filming all these episodes in a day's time and lacked the sleep to really focus on it when it came to the live segments. I mean, hell, look at my fucking hair. I look like a goddamn mess. But to this day, my opinion stands that the show for me just didn't work. The sci-fi concepts, the fusing, the discovery of other worlds, the whole thing didn't ring interest when it came to King Kong related material. However, for the next two episodes, I'll not only be covering two segments of the show that I only briefly mentioned in passing, but I'm also going to let my guard down a bit and give it a fair shake this time around. That of course being the two movies based on Kong the Animated Series. So let's start with the first film in this double feature with Kong King of Atlantis. It smells less like Kong's banana breath and more like Kong's piss water. Taking place at the probable end of season two, the movie opens oddly enough in vain of King Kong Lives, with Kong, vocals by Scott McNeil, climbs the Empire State Building as a nod to the original. But in a sudden change of events, the opening scene goes all day after tomorrow as the city floods to the mercy of the ocean. Though it turns out this was all a nightmare as Lua, voiced by Saffron Henderson, and suspects it was a shaman vision. She rides her pet saber to Tiger Chandler to the ancient temple of her ancestors to confirm her suspicions. As the eclipse draws close on Skull Island, Jason Jenkins, voiced by the late Kirby Murrow, along with his friend Tan, voiced by Scott McNeil, and Kong must find the key to restoring balance to the island before the eclipse. Why does every mission in some of these movies always involve the eclipse? We have to find the Dragon Balls before the eclipse. Yeah, can we not do that? But with the arrival of Lord Sankofis, voiced by Alec Willows, arrives on the island, he sees Kong as the future king of the long-lost sunken city of Atlantis. Oh good, maybe they'll come across Milo Techto and actually get some assistance. Low-key, that's a really underrated Disney movie. So to avoid Skull Island suffering the same fate, our heroes journey to the aquatic kingdom and encounter the many adventures, dangers, and villainy of the snake-like Queen Reptilia. Voiced by... God, I don't even know. Seriously, I looked it up and found nothing on IMDb. But can our heroes discover the secret of Atlantis' original demise? Or will Skull Island suffer the same fate as other incarnated sequels have done before? So, having given the series a second glance with the movie, how does King of Atlantis hold up, and does it make the show any better? Well, yes and no. One of the biggest points to the movie is that it's a little easier to watch than the show itself, because the biggest gripe the series has is that 40 episodes for a show like this for me 
is a tad too long. Not to mention, as I stated in other reviews, that outside the Godzilla series, I never saw King Kong as franchise material, especially given it was never Marion C. Cooper's intention. It was simply the love child story of Beauty and the Beast and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, and intended as a one-shot story that never needed a continuation. It was always a single 20th century fairy tale to me. So the series, along with countless spin-offs that involve cloning, mechs, and the like, I never really got into when it comes to this particular piece outside of the kaiju films. So this movie is a much more condensed and simplified version of the show itself, and for me, I do see some entertainment value. The first being mostly in its cast, because these are some top-rated voice actors in this movie. A lot of them were based in Canada and Vancouver, and have done a ton of work on kids' shows from the 90s onwards. Scott McNeil, of course, is a dime a dozen. This guy I've showcased a few times from Inuyasha to Beast Wars, and this is just another role that he has on his resume that I can enjoy, especially in the history of Kong. And outside of doing the roars for Kong, the character of Tan is basically a human version of Rat Trap. The Michelangelo type who's the party dude and has a few decent lines. Hell, another Beast Wars Inuyasha cast member presented is David Kay on the show voicing the character of Ramon de la Porta. While not in the movie, it is pretty fun to watch in portions of the show because it's David Kay. He does a great job in everything he's in. Yes, yes. And while the rest of the cast has its resume here and there, the top actor, of course, is the late Kirby Murrow as Jason Jenkins. While not the most added to his character from the show, it's just nice to hear his voice again. And he's done a ton of stuff for a lot of big name IPs, especially Lego. For those who watch Lego Ninjago, he's the voice of one of the characters. Hell, he even voiced Anakin Skywalker at one point. I say the Jedi were destroying the Republic, and the Emperor and I saved it. You didn't save it. Nuh-uh. Yaha. Uh -huh. What I said was true, from a certain point of view. So while the cast is the highlight, what about the rest of the movie? Well, for one thing I will say is that the animation got a massive upgrade, and it actually looks amazing compared to the series. It's like comparing the intro to Thundercats with the quality of the show. The budget was definitely increased this time around. For the dinosaurs and the creatures, they get a lot of awesome visual upgrades, reminding me a lot of the series Primal. Minus the puking rivers of blood, though. What the f- Fuck. Kong himself is very 50-50 in this movie. For one thing, like I said, the concept of fusions and all the sci-fi shit, I could really do without. Along with the design, it just looks really toyetic to me. I tried looking into if there was a toy line actually made or planned, but that ended up not being the case for the series at all, especially with the movie coming out in 2005. More than three years since the show ended, and at the time, Playmates was putting out toys for the Peter Jackson film. Hell, this movie was released least just in time for the Kong craze of the new movie's release, with all the previous incarnations of Kong being re-released on DVD to capitalize on the madness. However, compared to other films, this movie has a lot of problems, specifically the villains. The reptilian baddies of Atlantis, I feel personally, are generic and bland. They more or less fit as if Cobra got the mutagen from Ninja Turtles and created snake-esque humans. They all look like Sir Bentor for fuck's sakes. The main issue is that they are all so disinteresting and have very little planning and intimidation to meet. They're just your typical villain of the week, basically. Any anime villain in a movie has better character development. Even the design of Atlantis is pretty disinterested, and Kong's involvement with the plot really redcons a lot of the original film's lore, labeling Kong as originated from Atlantis, which is really freaking stupid and makes Kong way too important to the world's environment, to the point of utter ridiculousness. While the animation is an improvement to the show, it kind of reminds me of the direct-to-video sequels to The Land Before Time or something. I don't know, maybe we can move on to the music and- We have a job to do. What? So what? What? Me. This movie's a what? Yeah, so, um, this is the third Kong musical I've seen now. I was just making a joke about it, but now I figured out the biggest issue with this film. It's not that it's reminding me of a Land Before Time sequel, it's that it's trying to be a Land Before Time sequel, songs and length and all. And what makes it really distracting is that the show was never a musical! Not once, if at all, did these characters even break into song, and it really kills the whole flow of the movie and why it's padded to an hour and eight minutes! Can you hear and feel my heart say sorry once 
Because it fits the narrative and tone of the established lore since part two! This is absurd! I need an answer for this! Well, perhaps I could be of some assistance. Razorblade? What the hell are you doing here? We've bridged over since we both posted our Dragon Ball Evolution videos, idiot. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> Gee, I wonder where the corpse of that film is right now. Anyway, you covered all the Land Before Time sequels, so how the hell do you explain this transition of the franchise turning into sequels with multiple musical numbers? Well, that's probably because this movie did have some involvement with Warner Brothers, who also helped distribute the Mighty Kong back in 1998. And with the direct-to-video market still being a thing back in 2005, musical numbers were the norm, so it kind of made sense to do the same thing here. Much to everyone's aggravation. Well, much like the film, it looks like the stars aligned with the eclipse of this piece of shit. I mean, what else could go wrong? Well, there was also a video game based on the movie. What? Stop! Stop! Freaking stop! It's the Encanto review, dickhead. Happy gaming! Ugh. Let's just get this over with. Well, while we're on the subject, there's one or two video games on the 8th Wonder that I failed to mention in my video games episode. So let's take a look at Kong King of Atlantis for the Game Boy Advance. Well, okay, this doesn't look too bad. The graphics are nice, the music is okay, and they even transitioned the show's theme onto a 16-bit cartridge. <laughs> It opens with a long-ass text prologue as we start the game with Jenkins, and I'm not gonna lie, the presentation is okay actually, kind of reminding me of Aladdin on Super Nintendo, which as a side note is my favorite video game of all time. It's a simple side-scroller going around punching the creatures of Skull Island until you finally reach Kong and OH MY GOD! HE LOOKS HIDEOUS! He makes the CGI Donkey Kong show look like a better game to play! And that was a fucking cartoon show! At this point, you play as Kong, and it's pretty much the same generic controls. Jumping, punching, swinging the works. Hell, there's no sense of scale either, since the enemies are the same fucking size as they were for Jason! And a lot of them are the same, just Form 1 hexes from Fern Gully as a hentai tentacle. Seriously, isn't this supposed to be Skull Island? Where's all the dinosaurs? As someone who would have killed for a proper retro 16-bit game based on the iconic film, this is pathetic! I don't know, maybe someday I'll do a let's talk on what I would do on that particular topic. Eventually, you stop fighting these shitticles and battle over enemies like Atlanteans and the snake creatures from the movie. And while the game follows the movie well and can be beaten in under an hour, it really drags out making it more of a chore to get it done and over with. All in all, if you want to add this to your collection, then be my guest. But for me, this one you can skip, being utterly pointless. And you know what? That pretty much sums up the game and the movie it was based on. While I'm glad I could give the animated series a proper review in this episode, less can be said about this piss-poor quality of an animated feature. Overall, Kong King of Atlantis is boring as shit, and it has all the problems I have with the series. Namely, Kong being franchised out to this extent. The plot is stupid, it contradicts a lot of the lore, the animation, while higher class, is about the same quality as the show, and it's a stupid direct-to-video musical that not only cashes in on Disney direct-to-video sequels, the Land Before Time sequels, but the Peter Jackson movie long after the show's cancellation. If you really want to add this to your Kong film collection, it's harmless and can be found for pennies on the market. Hell, I picked up the whole fucking series for $5 at a dollar store. That's as bottom of the barrel as you can go for this coming, and all in all, is a dull 2.5 out of 10. It's not the worst I've seen of movies I've covered, but it's still pretty damn bad. But if you like it, you like it. I'm not stopping you. However, in my opinion, this movie can sink to the bottom of the sea with Atlantis intact.
But alas, that's not the real ending to the animated series, is it? So join me next time as we take a look at the CGI sequel. Let's just get it over with.